Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you for joining us. I think this can be a really interesting session. Although we will be looking in some detail at the situation in the UK uh, and at some particular technologies, I think there's a lot of principles here that could apply anywhere in the world. So uh, I hope that it'll be of interest to you. You can submit questions via Slido. There will be a specific question and answer session after a short break. But if you have questions earlier on, feel free to send them in early and we can get them on the list if you like. So I am Tamandra Harkness. I'm a broadcaster. I do a lot of Radio 4 documentaries, including the Future Proofing series, which is still available as a podcast. Uh, and I wrote the book, Big Data Does Size Matter? We have three great speakers for this session who are really involved in the issues they're going to be talking about. So uh, we're going to start off with Rachel Caldercutt, who is the former CEO of Dot Everyone, a responsible technology think tank, uh, as opposed to the irresponsible technology think tanks. Uh, and she also serves on the ethics task force of the Law Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering. We're then going to hear from uh, Michael Veal, who's a lecturer in digital rights and regulation at UCL, University College London. He was involved in uh, a project that has become very important and influential, DP3T, uh, which is the decentralized privacy protecting proximity tracing uh, protocol, which in fact has been uh, adopted by Google and Apple and therefore by a lot of people in the world. I hope he's going to tell us something about that. And then finally, Professor Lillian Edwards, who is Professor of Law, Innovation and Society at Newcastle University, formerly of many other universities, including Strathclyde, Edinburgh, Southampton, Sheffield, and also has close links with the Oxford Internet Institute. So I've asked them to give us introductions as brief as possible, considering the, the depth of the subject, uh, on the topic of the Coronavirus Safeguards Bill 2020. But it's, it's about proposed legal protections for digital interventions, uh, especially in relation to immunity certificates, although not only that. So, uh, so let's first of all go to Rachel. Rachel, would you like to give us an introduction into how, how all these things came maybe to your attention uh, and how then they unfolded? Hi, yeah. So I suppose in March, which this seems like now a hundred, um, a hundred um, years ago, when it was still possible to be bumping into people and um, talking about things. Um, there was a, a lot of, uh, how can I put it? There was a lot of questions in the air about the way that people thought and understood the NHS was likely to be using te um, uh, te um, no technology to address the, uh, the virus. And I think in about like mid-March, um, the, the CMO was on the Radio 4 talking about how he was very attracted by some of the things that were happening in South Korea um, and kind of intrigued by the way technology was being used to implement contact uh, tracing there. And this was a really interesting moment because it was a point at which two completely different worlds began to come to, to together in terms of, I think, a lot of people who work in technology and private see certainly at that point two um, months ago or three now were definitely not experts in public health the surveillance and I think even the word the surveillance you know makes everybody very worried and tense and I think during March there began to be in the community that I'm a part of a conversation about as we're inevitably walking into a moment where the surveillance will be rolled out in exceptional times for public health needs, how is technology likely to work? And I suppose kind of where, where my involvement here, I guess, begins and ends, um, is that it felt like extraordinary ways to use technology to understand how people were moving about to maybe give people more uh, freedom as they were able to do that 
would come with enormous uh, consequences from the perspective of data capture, from the perspective of how the NHS and potentially the government might use technology. And so it felt like the things that were really important there were to be transparent and open and clear and honest about how the technology was likely to work, how the data was likely to be captured, the ways of working. And um, one of the things that I think I really strongly believe is that making good digital products is not the mystery. It is kind of now an incredibly commercialized art form. And that what we began to see was that the NHS were, were choosing or NHSX were choosing not to do things in the way that was kind of up to that point best the practice. And so there was a lack of openness. People within um, NHSX approached me because they were very concerned. They didn't know what was happening in their own or, their own or, or organization. The role of Palantir at that time was very unclear. Um, for instance, there was a lot of nervousness about that. And, and so at the end of March, uh, I kind of corralled a group of experts into helping write an open um, letter asking for more clarity, more transparency, more openness. Uh, sort of really saying this is a great opportunity to build the trust, um, to develop ways of, collect, of collecting consent that will help the public to understand what's happening. And I suppose from my perspective, having asked in a very, I think, um, kind of clear and reasonable way, what then happened was not a lot. And so I think probably where um, um, some of, of the things we're about to hear about start, started to happen was almost in a communications uh, vacuum in the UK. And so from a, a contact tracing perspective, and then who knows, the immunity certificates and onwards, what was happening is there was a huge opportunity to speculate, to worry, to be concerned because there was a lack of information in the public. Um, and that lack of information, it then turned out, was kind of tied to a very big ambition to launch an app that would have the cut through of the WhatsApp uh, in a couple of months where, you know, without that public uh, trust. And so I suppose the thing I'm really interested in here is what is the opportunity for NHSX moving on to build trust, to be open, to kind of have clarity with the public about um, what they're making, how that data is going to be used, how our behaviour might be changed, and to sort of develop that together rather than doing it uh, secretly and then launching it and expecting us all to be happy about it. I guess. Great. Thank you very much, Rachel. So, so that's the beginning of the story, right back in March when technology was still something that might help us, but nobody really knew how. Uh, some people did start to worry, thankfully, about what how it might be misused. And it is nice to hear that some people inside NHSX were among those worrying. So to take up the story, uh, Michael, what happened next? <laughs> Um, in in parallel to this, uh, there were uh, I, I was I was getting involved um, with a group of researchers across Europe, uh, and we were we were responding really to the the meme, the technological meme that we've seen, particularly in Singapore, of using mobile phones to understand if you can notify somebody if they have been near somebody who later diagnosed positive with COVID nineteen. 
this work, um, as we learn more and with our epidemiologists on this, this team with eight universities across Europe, as we learn more about the disease, this became increasingly important and salient because uh, we recognize the disease was spreading fast. Some people who you might have given it to, you might not know the name of, or you might not be able to remember all the places that you had been, and that it may be with us for a long time. Uh, so, so there were lots of factors that that we thought would draw we thought would draw governments into this this uh, this type of app or approach. So, in response to that, we were concerned that there were there are many different ways to make this app, and there are many different ways to make this kind of system. Some of which are both much more invasive, unnecessarily so, than others, and some of which have a great potential for for reuse and and scope and function creep. This is where something becomes you know, used for, for illegitimate purposes beyond its initial design. So what we were doing is trying to put a technology on the table, uh, knowing that all technologies would be mature, put a really rigorously built tested technology on the table, almost as a challenge to say, if governments, particularly those in regimes with limited respect for human rights, particularly those with limited respect for human rights in an emergency situation, which we thought actually many countries were at danger of, um, limited scrutiny, limited democratic process. If countries want to adopt a, a technology that is potentially quite invasive, we will provide a challenge. That challenge is a uh, what we aspire to be the best functioning version of that technology um, that, that works as well as it could, but which respects uh, many of those rights and limits uh, function creep by design. It really bakes in some, not all core principles we were concerned about, but the ones that could be baked into the technology we bake in. So what are these concerns? Well, these concerns, for example, um, apps were largely settling on using Bluetooth at this point. There's a few reasons for that. GPS is not really um, specific enough in location to understand if you are near somebody else. It also doesn't work across multi-story buildings or indoors. Um, cellular data has similar problems. Other approaches such as ultrasound require your microphone to be turned on, and we thought that would uh, significantly limit trust. So Bluetooth was a kind of settled on technology here. The challenge is that Bluetooth is commonly used for commercial tracking. And Bluetooth to, in device to device communications can, in one configuration, be used to really create a, a social network of society, a fabric of who saw who, which devices were near other devices, and we know that this kind of network data is uh, really ripe for abuse, whether it's uh, understanding groups of people who you suspect to have um, an illegal uh, immigration status um, or, or, and to be in the country to be in the country unlawfully or to, to just target them for other reasons, understanding communities for the, for the purpose of persecution. But also you can use these kind of systems to implement and enforce quarantine control or to monitor how often people go to the railway station or the supermarket. There's a lot of function creep here. So we designed a system that had a decentralization at its core. The idea being is that no centralized database and no persistent identifiers would be created in this process. We worked uh, with privacy engineers, epidemiologists, lawyers, cryptographers, really to build the system that we call DP3T. Another thing at the heart was interoperability. So aware that a lot of the pressure, particularly in Europe, was on reopening Schengen, we are anticipating there would be a call for apps to work across borders. We were trying hard not to push an app for an app's sake. We didn't. Uh, we were very skeptical about the efficacy of this system at all. Again, we were responding and saw the train was going down a direction, building on code which could really easily be misused and mispurposed um, in the future, particularly if it didn't work. There will be a huge temptation to add on more and more until maybe it did. But instead to turn that train and say, no, if you want a contact tracing system, not a general data gathering system, not an enforcement system, and that's what you say you want politically, here's a tool that you can pledge to use. And if you don't use it, there are questions as to why you chose a different one and what you were trying to achieve. So this, um, we, we built actually, we built the protocol, we're publishing it all very openly, we built the code, everything is public domain. Um, uh, under a permissive copy left license, which improves transparency down the stream, downstream. Um, and we released it. And many countries started to use and adopt our system. So I think initially it was Switzerland and Austria, and then Estonia and Germany, and um, and, and countries were were toppling uh, towards this direction very quickly. And there was a lot of pressure from academics, NGOs, scientists to um, to use this approach, which would develop very closely with epidemiologists to allow it to 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 improve over time and various other aspects. What happened then was uh, kind of where the story um, uh, you know, 
bifurcates a bit and where I can also leave for, for future discussion and questions. At this point, um, Apple and Google came around. So whenever you make an app as a government, you are de facto entering a public-private partnership because Apple and Google control the operating system, they control the hardware in practice in Google sense and in fact, uh, in, uh, in, in, in fact and by law indeed in Apple sense. So uh, you, you work with these companies and you have to to access their sensors. Apple had, uh, in my view rightly, for a long number of years, blocked Bluetooth in the background in apps. Now, Apple don't block everything in the background in apps. They don't block a lot of trackers, and they should be criticized for that. But they did limit the access to Bluetooth when an app is off, because Bluetooth is commonly used for in-store tracking. However, this is the same kind of technology you needed for contact tracing. As a result, countries like Singapore and Australia that worked on a certain code base needed the phone to be unlocked on and in your pocket for this system to work. Uh, and that was really unsustainable, unfeasible. So you need buy-in from the operating systems. Um, <coughs> we've been talking to them, but what was surprising is they, they came out and said, we, and we will not facilitate countries to make centralized databases by providing the code building blocks they would need additionally to, to do that in the operating system. Uh, either way, uh, app, on Apple phones, you would need an operating system update to run a, um, to run a, uh, a centralized contact trading system such as that that's currently being pursued by the uh, by the NHS, who use a very complex series of quite fragile workarounds, which require you to be near Android phones the whole time to keep your phone alive in the background with unclear implications of battery in crowded spaces. So um, in, in short, what we, we found here is that, that Apple and Google made a, a political decision on behalf of, of the world to say we will not support centralized systems, but we will support and facilitate decentralized systems. This annoyed countries, particularly France, who, who have um, been uh, making a big deal about their digital, digital sovereignty in regard to this particular piece of software. Um, but I think the question I want to leave it on is, is an important one for the future. We were building this as a political choice for governments to say, if you want to bind uh, yourself to a particular course of action, Here's how you do it. Should Apple and Google be facilitating that choice or not? Do and, and this boils down to should states be able to determine what is in an operating system that runs in their their national national government? Should they be able a national country? Should they be able to force Apple to propagate a system update? Would this mean that they could propagate it to break encryption or to to affect other countries, neighboring countries, because this is a global standard? And I think this is an issue we have to grapple with going forwards. How do we deflate this kind of platform power? Because this platform power um, does have legitimacy problems. But either way, um, we, we had a narrow set of goals around allowing governments to pledge to, to not misuse a system. And we think uh, given that really uh, the majority of countries that have declared they want to use apps are now using a decentralized approach, we think that privacy preserving technologies and these kind of technologies are definitely mature and um, uh, have a lot of promise uh, in future applications as well, especially working at speed. It's been really hard to, uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, we've all been working at speed and at distance, um, but that was a really uh, challenging part going forward. So I'll, I'll leave that part of the story there and go to Lillian, who will talk, I think, about other issues that we were concerned about too. Great, thank you, Michael, that was fantastic. So Lillian, I mean, you're obviously coming at this from a, a slightly different point of view, uh, in as much as you're you're looking less at the code that's actually inside the device and more perhaps at the at the legal code. She said, making a really cheesy segue, uh, but, but, but but to zoom out if you like and, and look at how how should society, how should law deal with these issues. So, yeah, I really like this kind of narrative stream that we're doing. I've done so many of these webinars now, and this is the first one like this. So the, the, the kind of, you know, home story about this is that about the same time that Michael was working 94 hours a day on DP3T, I was actually ill with the virus. At least I think I was because I never got tested. Um, I don't know if Tamandra did either. And because I was talking to Michael about it quite a lot from my sick bed, um, I became worried that at that point, and this does seem like ancient history now, that at that point the debate was becoming entirely techno-solutionist, which is very much the word of this um, year's COGX, I think, um, in that the debate had got down to 
decentralized good for privacy centralized bad for privacy was what seemed to be happening and nhsx our, our people were doggedly well they were heading in the direction perhaps not doggedly of a centralized system for reasons that probably made perfectly good sense at the beginning because the dp3t protocol something that michael didn't get to mention is really quite solidly based on alerts being derived from positive corona tests you know saying that you have the disease um, whereas those tests were simply not available in the UK at the time that they were specifying their app, which was very unfortunate. And therefore, to some extent, they claim anyway that they were forced to go to a centralized system where there could be more risk scoring centrally um, so as to try and weed out some of the false positives that you would inevitably get from alerts based on self-reported symptoms, right? We've all been like, you know, I have a cold. Oh, my God, I have coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> so that was some of the background. Um, so I came in on this as a lawyer who was interested in if we were going to go down the centralized route for good or bad reasons, then what kind of problems might arise that were not being solved simply by this kind of get out of jail free code that had now been espoused by Apple and Google? And particularly, I, uh, I felt that we were ignoring, or not ignoring, but we were not forefronting the social context of how these apps might be used, both then and in the future. You know, and a lot of this was about future gazing, mm -hmm. and that's a big challenge. How far, when you don't know what our technology will turn out to be like, when you haven't even specified it yet, do you even try to regulate it in advance? Is that just another form of ethics washings, where you just do these really top level principles? And that was a worry. But anyway, my, my worries came down to a series of questions. You know, if this was going to be something that was essential to getting us out of lockdown, as we all hoped, and defeating the virus, um, what was going to happen to the people who didn't have smartphones, for example? What was going to happen to the people, I always mention my mum at this point, who did have a smartphone, but would inevitably leave the house without it or without it charged or without having turned on Bluetooth and so forth and so on? Would they in some way be either socially or legally penalised? Um, now, that's one where it's a no-brainer everyone just goes no that would never happen you know and the government has said this would always be voluntary etc etc but but uh, you know it's something that would be nice to think about but what my key worry was the the second point that we tried to bring out in the bill i should have said sorry that what ended up was me and a team drafting a model bill of safeguards uh, relating to coronavirus contact tracing apps, okay? So the first thread of it was that no one should be penalized for not having a smartphone or for not using it optimally. But the second point, which is what I was coming to, um, was my fear that, now the, the background research on this again is, and you've probably heard this, contact tracing apps are a new technology and they probably only work if a lot of people are using them right otherwise the, the 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 network effects don't work the false positives build up etc cetera, etc cetera. so oxford research came out saying that um around 80 percent of smartphone users had to use it for it to be optimally successful it could be a much lower number but that was kind of the ballpark you needed since 20 percent of people in this country and many other countries don't have smartphones that came down to about 60 percent of the population uh, later, that got revised down to about 50%. But that's still a hell of a lot, right? Um, I think the, the figure for like the most successful app ever was the download of WhatsApp, which was 56% of the population. And WhatsApp is actually useful, you know. <laughs> uh, so, as in, it lets you talk to your friends, you know, make comments. Um, whereas the app on your phone isn't actually going to do anything for you. It's going to do things for other people. Right. So it's, it's actually quite altruistic. Uh, so, OK, given that we had a social motivation towards incentivizing everyone to use it or, you know, up to 50 percent of people hopefully to use it. What kind of incentives were we going to see and were those incentives going to turn into coercion and discrimination? You know, the plot thickens here. So I began because I'm a paranoid lawyer to think about, you know, workplaces is the most obvious example. Are you not going to be allowed to go back to your workplace unless you have the app installed? Um, that might be all right for you if you're a nice workplace where they still give you your money, like my workplace, I'm an academic, if you don't go into work, but not so great if you're a gig worker, a zero uh, hours worker, a, a poor level economy worker, a service worker, yeah, and you just don't get any money if you don't go there. Would they require that you showed the messages on your phone? Oh my God, that's my cat. <laughs> 
<laughs> she hasn't done that in any of the previous webinars I've been on. Go away. <laughs> I knew, knew that would happen. Um, oh, well, that just cements my reputation, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, if it, would there be these kinds of invasions of your privacy and your autonomy at your workplace? And if you if they ha happened, how would it differentially affect groups? It seemed to me it would differentially affect the poor as opposed to the rich, the face-to-face uh, -face workers as opposed to the knowledge economy workers. There was also quite a lot of anecdotal evidence that certain ethnic groups would be more likely let, to feel worried about downloading the app because they might fear, rightly or wrongly, that it would have bad consequences for them. So here you might be talking about groups like Islamic people who might fear being connected to terrorist groups. It might be people who were worried about their immigration status being prejudiced. It might be people who were self-employed and were worried that in some way they'd be done over by the DWP. So you might have a kind of double discrimination in which people were scared to install the app for fear of surveillance and then similarly double discrimination might be discriminated against for not having the app in the workplace yeah and there was less likely scenarios which really haven't happened but still could which were you know if you didn't have the app would you be allowed to go to a public park would you be allowed to go to a football stadium when they reopen would you be believe, allowed to leave your house you know would it be used to in some way police your quarantine so these were all major worries that really weren't met by the architecture and so what we included was quite a strong clause that no one should be compelled to install this app and no one should be compelled to share the messages delivered by the app, the contact alerts, say to an employer or an insurer or the school or your university or whatever. That was one of the key points. As time has gone on, um, it has also become problematic, I think, to think forward to immunity certificates, which we mentioned at the start. How am I doing for time? Uh, You've got a couple of minutes. Okay, sorry, the cat distracted me. I, I did have a timer on. <laughs> um, so we don't have immunity certificates yet. Indeed, the science, the science. If there's a phrase I hate in 2020, <laughs> it is the science. Show me the science. Um, immunity certificates don't exist yet, not really. They're out, they do have them in Chile, but they've made it up um, because we don't know if an antibody test is reliable and we don't know if it gives you immunity. And I, speaking as someone who thinks they've had it, would really like them to work. But um, how are they going to work if we do get them, which is what everyone hopes, I think, um, for everyone, meaning governments. Are they going to become internal passports? You know, are they going to allow anybody to stop you moving around, stop you getting on trains, stop you getting on buses, stop you getting on planes? Are they going to become some kind of exclusion from economic activity? Now, you say this is where it gets hard. You say that's fine. That's what they're meant to do. The purpose of an immunity certificate is to discriminate. Right. But some kinds of discrimination are going to be unreasonable and disproportionate. And so at that point within our draft bill, which you could have seen the URL for if I'd got the slides to it. I can post it somewhere. Um, within our draft bill, we decided at that point to invoke a very familiar human rights scrutiny analysis test, too many adjectives, which is that you look at whether the measure is proportionate to the legitimate goal, the gain that you 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 reach right the, this public social gain yeah and if it isn't proportionate then it's not okay and at that point you should have a right to take that requirement that measure to some kind of oversight commissioner board tribunal something like that okay so that's the model and it'd be interesting to see if any of this happens when we actually do get to the immunity certificate stage and at that point i'd better stop Excellent. Thank you, Lillian. Now, between the three of you, you've given us a really good overview of, of how we got to here uh, and also thrown up a lot of really major issues that, that we need to address through both technology and law. I, I certainly feel it's my role here as a moderator to play devil's advocate for a moment. Who's that? Whose cat is playing the flute? <laughs> that was that was actually my um, stopwatch going. That on, is so stopwatch. I want to do my ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Even the cat. I don't, I don't um, know where the cat's gone. She's something now. Okay. She'll come back. <laughs> you're speaking. Yeah. So it, I, I feel I have to play devil's advocate because mm. you know we can we can point the finger at NHS X and say why on earth did they go for a mm. less private model of the app? Why have they been so secretive? Why haven't they realised that they need public trust? But the fact is, we're at the early stage of uh, a new disease 
that's having major effects. And what they want to do is collect data that will help them understand and then later to predict the course of the disease so that we can get out of general lockdown and, and target controls just on infection control. And that it's very hard to say now what data will be useful later. So they might they might not know what data they want to collect through this app. And therefore, surely it's more honest to keep it open and say, we want to build an app that will let us perhaps later add location data, or maybe we do want to go back and trace two or three levels of, of the contacts you've had, or maybe we need to add in personal information about you to assess your risk level. Is it not justified during the pandemic to do things that you would never normally contemplate? And maybe I could come back to Rachel initially for your thoughts on this. Is it not time to set aside things that we would normally be concerned about and normally not allow the state to do in order to put public health issues first? Now, I think I think the first thing is I might feel very differently about this if the ways the technology was being created align with a best practice. And so the ask for open and uh, scrutinizable data, the ask for uh, you know transparent governance wasn't met, and it it feels to me like in a world where um, you know there's a very well doc well um, documented decrease in the trust in technology that actually to choose not to be open at a time like this is is almost a kind of intention create an environment where people are speculating you know and uh, so I think one of the things that's happened that's been quite damaging in the last couple of months is the lack of clarity has led to a lot of um what ifery because it's it's had to mm. and I think at every every moment there's been a tussle between mm. you know none of us can imagine a world in which you would have to take your phone with you in order to leave the house but three months ago none of us could imagine a world in which it wasn't possible to leave the house and so at a time when the goalposts are moving for everything the unimaginable becomes incredibly possible and I think this is why the bill is really important to have the safety guards there to say we will move to here but um uh, but um not further because it's always possible to change your mind later on but i think it's very dangerous to have no say guards at all yeah. so i don't know if michael or lillian if you'd like to come in on the same question michael yeah it's just just a bit of, uh, yeah i so i think obviously in, in a public health crisis uh, a lot of things are are justified, but I think it's not justified to leave everything open ended without safeguards or, as Rachel says, without without process. The role of privacy engineering, which is also really um, purpose limitation engineering, you, you limit a purpose in by design, is that you specify clearly what you want to do at the outset, um, and that can be fairly broad. Like you can want to run, you, know, you can say, I want to run arbitrary calculations on this type of data, or I want to be able to get this kind of outputs from people, or I want to do second level contact tracing. But, but you need a problem frame. And I think the risk that we've seen in the UK is that there has been no set of requirements built early on for this app. It's been, it's been queued up in the air. There have also then been, uh, there's been no, no process to communicate the requirements as they're, as they're changing. And worryingly, what would make me more comfortable with a centralized system or the like uh, in the UK is if they, if the government had said we will legislate specific narrow safeguards that will really hold us accountable to what we're saying and what we're doing. Mm. And that hasn't occurred either. So you do really, it does really get quite, um, quite concerning, concerning there. But also, lastly, the trade-offs need to be made clear. The trade-offs that say, Actually, if you choose this, you're not going to be able to interoperate with other countries. Or if you choose this in the current environment, it's not going to work on many people's smartphones. So these trade-offs are not always so clear. And, and, and instead, I do worry about the influence of particularly private actors in this, in this area 
who we saw in Germany, because we worked very closely in, in the German uh, political and economic context around their app um, system, we saw the contractors really wanted a centralized database to get lucrative public sector contracts for managing backend servers. Um, our backend server, which is like a relay server, it just is for efficiency, is incredibly simple. It's just a list of two variables for the entire country, and you can't learn anything about individuals from those two variables. So it's just time and a random identifier that's generated by your device uh, forever, um, like a bulletin board. And it's you know that's not doesn't really cost much to maintain. So yeah, that's what I would think in this. And that's why I'm a bit concerned about the process in the UK. And can in I, fact, Jamie, coming on to you. Yeah. I, well, yeah, because I was just thinking it's interesting that Australia, for example, mm. did, I mean, certainly initially, I don't think it changes, but they initially went down the centralized route where all the signals that get sent and received by Bluetooth go into the centralized server and that mm. does all the matching. But they also, did they not, rapidly put into law regulations yes. which look suspiciously close to the bill in fact that you and some others drew up just a tad um yeah yeah i didn't do this all just for an impact case study for the ref but it certainly makes one um <laughs> <laughs> it's all about me <laughs> um yes yes the, the, what happened was um we wrote the bill about two weeks later to my utter astonishment because yeah the, the bill had been written really as a provocation as a proof of concept um, to say that uh, these safeguards were necessary and, you know, would someone like to think about them? But I was told repeatedly by at least two uh, leading politicians that it would never, ever get into Parliament and perhaps it never, ever will. But, yeah, two weeks later, the Australian app came out, which was also centralised, like the UK NHSX app, and it came out simultaneously with its privacy impact assessment, which we then fought tooth and claw to get for the, the UK app, and with a bill. And the bill did indeed have a clause that looked remarkably like our no coercion clause, the one that said that no one could be required to make you install the app or to show the alerts on your phone, you know, and that couldn't socially penalise you. So well, that was pleasing. Um, one thing I would add, right, to, to go to, and that was a great question, Tamandra, it's a really great provocation question because there is too much agreement here on this panel probably, um, is there are things law can do and there's a, there's another thing law can do that i didn't get time to talk about so one of the responses that the government's continually made that matt hancock's continually made to suggestions that there should be a bill of safeguards which doesn't seem like an outlandish desire you know and this isn't just me the joint human rights committee and indeed the, the parliamentary science and technology committee which is led by a former tory minister both really want there to be a bill of safeguards and harriet Harman has been um, making great attempts to get this onto the agenda you know even a 10 minute bill the lib dems want a bill there's a lot of support um one of the reasons why they keep saying we can't have a bill is because we've got data protection already and data protection will cover everything now data protection is great but data protection is very enabling it is meant to help people to process and share data to a very large extent rather than not share and collect and use socially for social and commercial good data so if you say the purpose of the day of collecting the data is to fight the coronavirus uh, in time, in perpetuum, you know, and pass it to researchers, then you can keep the data forever. And this is the kind of worry that Michael and his team had, that the data would be kept forever, that it would leak into the private sector, that indeed there would be security leaks, because when you have a big data like that with many people accessing it, you do get security leaks, and that we would be setting up mass surveillance for the foreseeable future. Um, so what we said was there should be a sunset clause. There should be a period after which you're not allowed to retain this data. And that takes you in various useful practical directions. If what you want is the data to be personal and identifying, then you only really need to keep it for as long as um, people can be infectious. And that's 21 to 28 days. And that's what New Zealand came up with, was get rid of the data after 28 days. Then you'll say, oh, we need to keep it for the research, obviously, for the next generation, for the next pandemic, for the continuing pandemic. But in that case, you can anonymize, right? Now, anonymization itself, as Tamandra knows very, very well is a very contentious process because it seems like if you have enough data and god knows we have enough data nowadays you can re-identify anything but still it's a start and you would hope that anonymization in the nhs context also meant social anonymization you know organizational measures as well as technical measures but and this is where we come back to rachel's transparency point 
this is one of my particular annoyances. It did seem like the messaging that came out in the DPIA, in various blogs, et cetera, from NHSX was deliberately trying to muddy that water. So we were told that data was anonymous in the security sense, when it was clearly pseudonymous, as I think they said later in the same document. And pseudonymous under the GDPR is personal data and data protection safeguards apply. So there's been quite a lot of, deliberately or not, kind of very obfuscatory language used. And again, I think that has not been helpful in what has been claimed to be this, this plea for trust and confidence. End of rant. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left before <laughs> we take a short break and then we will come back for Q&A. So it's not, it's not the end of the conversation. Sorry. No, no, it's good. This is all really good, interesting stuff. Uh, I suppose I'd just to briefly pick up on the question, which in fact Michael threw out and, and somebody has already put in through the Slido as, as a similar question, which is the relationship between Google and Apple and mm. government. Because normally I, I would be the first to say we should look to our elected governments to make these decisions because we can unelect them, whereas Google and Apple are slightly secretive corporations based in Silicon Valley and answerable to nobody. On this, on this occasion, they seem to have situated themselves on the side of privacy, rather against national governments. What do you think the long-term consequences of this will be for uh, how much trust in Google and Apple we have? I mean, did somebody, uh, uh, Maria, put in as, as a question already, why do people trust Google and Apple more than elected governments? I mean, we, we do only have about a minute left, but if anyone would like to come back with a really pithy answer on this, and then maybe we can start off with that in the Q&A session. That's Michael, I think. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> pithy answer. I think it's about process as well. Like, you know, this is... It's still public health authorities making the app. It's just the kind of very low level technology that's close to the operating system. And we know those are, are value laden, but I don't think we're asking the public then to, to trust Google and Apple in this. I think it's more that they can see that governments in a crisis are, are not very good at developing technology and scoping their problems. Um, and, and that's, I think, where the lack of trust is. And that's a key thing to build more trust in, which means we need more capacity for problem scoping mm. in the public. And I'm going to push back today. Yeah. The government released really, really bad AI and AI procurement guidelines. And I think they were released at COGX as well. And they say, don't define your 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 actual the technologies you need. Define a broad problem mm. and put it out to tender. That is exactly what should not happen. And that's exactly why we will lose trust. And those guidelines are extremely bad for UK public sector AI. Fantastic. Well, I, we have about a minute left. So does anyone want to throw in a final well, thought before we take a little break? Yeah, the, the last thing I'd add, because I'm less technical than Michael, so for the less technical, is the reason why you can trust Google and Apple in this and not your government or our government is because Google and Apple aren't having access to any of your personal data via this decentralized app, as I understand it, whereas your government is. So, you know, you may trust your government with your data, but you don't have to make that choice to trust them with the decentralized model. But yeah, I think there is a bit of misunderstanding that what we're not we're not doing is giving some big data free gift to Google and Apple, because I wouldn't support that. Well, so on that note, uh, I'm going to hand back, uh, I think, to our to Tabitha. Uh, and I think we're going to take a, a small break and then come back and deal with questions. And we've already had a couple of good questions in, so I think it's going to be a great session. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.